I have a confession to make. For many years, I did something to pay the rent that I'm not very proud of. It's euphemistically called event entertainment, but let's call it what it really was. I was a party clown of the rich and famous. <laughs> Flashback to the 1980s. I'm performing at this event in the ballroom of the Plaza Hotel. Now that might be interesting, but the Plaza's charm had worn off of 15 or 20 guy guy galas ago. The Plaza does things to people, bad things. No wonder Eloise grew up to be an alcoholic. <laughs> anyway, what's unique about this gig is that I'm working for New York's top entertainment company, event entertainment company, Le Fru Fru. And we're being filmed tonight by the TV show Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous which was basically a travelogue promoting celebrity worship that should have been called Bad Taste of the Bourgeoisie. <laughs> the host was Robin Leach, an arbiter of the finer things that you and I will never have without going into debt so far we become indentured servants. I imagine Robin Leach narrating. <clears throat> Tonight on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, we spotlight a theatrical troupe whose sole job it is to help the wealthiest people in the world have fun at their own party. They performed everywhere, from the opening night party of Trump Tower in New York to the opening night party of Trump Casino in Atlantic City. Not to mention Donald Trump's New Year's Eve party. Three different times. Three. One for each wife. <laughs> you want to throw a bar mitzvah that will make the neighbors jizz in their jockeys? One New York millionaire rented the luxury line of QE2. <laughs> Complete with the Peter Douche in orchestra. <laughs> the city council president even flew in on a helicopter to congratulate the young lad and repay the dad for his campaign contributions. But uh, the affair would not have been complete without La Fru Fru. The father was later indicted for conspiracy to defraud the IRS. But who's counting? The IRS, obviously. <laughs> Having a political event that these clowns put the fun in fundraisers, partying with everyone from Mario Cuomo on the Brooklyn waterfront, no mafia jokes, capiche? <laughs> to Ronald Reagan at the Washington Hilton. Yes, the same Washington Hilton, where he'd already been shot. What's wrong with this man's memory? <laughs> and who then are these performers that get to rub elbows with some of the world's most fabulous personalities? Well, they're mainly unemployed actors and dancers who've carved out a niche for themselves in this tiny subcategory of show business with no chance of vertical mobility and every opportunity for humiliation. These thespians persevere in brightening up parties that they themselves would never be invited to. So the director of our lifestyle segment is in the dressing room having me do my impression of Robin Leach for the cameras while wearing our oversized paper mache mask of leech that entirely covers my own head, one of our celebrity big heads. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, all the while, leech is making off-color jokes about my big head like, they say the larger the hat size, the smaller the penis. <laughs> so I say, yeah? Well, your wife told me I give new meaning to the phrase, great head. <laughs> I got him. Then the direct... <laughs> The director directs me to take my big hat off so they can zoom in on my face, still doing my impression. Don't worry, we want to show the man behind the mask. So, when the segment airs, my friends come over to my place to watch and cheer me on. I hear Leech's voice, Hey, someone who looks familiar. Cut to me, talking, with the mask on. Then cut to just my hands, putting the big head back into his case. Voice over Leech, not a bad impression either. And... Fade out. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> that was the first time I experienced famous interruptus. <laughs> but it wasn't the last. Rewind to 1983. The first time I met Donald Trump was at the opening of his home in Castle, Trump Tower. At the time, before he built his 58-story monolith, people said, You can't tell Don Bun with Teller Building. It's a New York City landmark. Trump had one word for them. Wrong. <laughs> then he had some other words. I'm going to completely demolish that loser. <laughs> what he replaced it with was a perfect representation of Trump himself. An oversized, unwelcoming, insensitive behemoth. Cold as the steel bones that hold it upright, yet as fragile as the glass skin it's wrapped in. Glass that coincidentally has a strange orangish tint. <laughs> so it's opening night and I'm standing at the front door, positioned to greet the guests. The 
press is everywhere, cameras at the ready. I'm dressed in my signature costume, the human television, <clears throat> a newsman who just happens to have a two-dimensional TV screen attached to his body. There's no glass in the frame, so I can reach through with a prop microphone and ask journalistically, can you believe how fabulous this party is? So up pulls this embarrassingly elongated limo. The smaller the hands, the longer the limo, right? <laughs> and out steps Donald and Ivana, a.k.a. Ni uh, wife number one. <laughs> They're looking very, well, trumped up. I stick out my fake microphone and say, Welcome to the grand opening of Trump Tower! Would you like to say something to the folks at home? Trump looks me up and down. Yeah, remember, my costume makes me look like I'm on TV from the waist up, yet I'm acting as if I'm an on-the-scene reporter interviewing him. Trump is thrown by this incongruity. And I guess an appreciation of irony is not part of his excellent temperament. I can see his mind working. It's not a pretty sight. <laughs> Am I supposed to watch this guy on TV? Yeah. Or pretend that I'm on TV with him? <laughs> hey, that would be cool if I had my own TV show. I could pretend to fire people. I'd like to fire this loser right now. <clears throat> but he, um, no, oh, yeah, he decides to, uh, to go along with me. Um, oh, actually, I, I'd like to point out that I am one of the very few people who has ever seen Donald Trump's mind working. Man. <laughs> it scarred me for life. So then he does decide to play along with me, and he says, Oh, I'd like to say to everyone, come to Trump Tower for shopping like you've never seen. We've got tremendous stores, not lightweight stores, bigly stores. We're open from 10 to 8 with shopping on all five levels. Now, Trump is on record saying, quote, I know words. I have the best words, but there's no better word than stupid. So the party gets going and everybody's dancing. Out of the corner of my eye, I spot Donald talking to another big guy who's about his size. It's Penthouse Magazine publisher Bob Guccione, the Gooch, as he was fondly known. Their conversation's heating up. Their body language is getting all alpha male aggressive. It looks like one of them's going to bump the other one with his chest. I imagine their conversation. My wife's breasts are bigger than your wife's. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, at least my wife's breasts are real. Real? Yeah, real saggy. <laughs> hey, watch it or I'll, I'll, I'll tell the media about your wife's sex video. How'd you know about that? Well, I didn't. Uh, I, I, just a guess. <laughs> you love it. I bet it's tremendous, Gooch. Now, uh, the word Gooch is actually, um, slang for the area between the testicles and the anus. And I think in this case, there's no better word than gooch. Yeah, so then, uh, who comes over to talk to me about penthouse pet of the year? She's being very playful, touching my dials on my TV costume. Then she says to me, if you let me play with your knobs, I'll let you play with mine. Then it dawns on me. She's stoned out of her centerfold mind. But before I can excuse myself, she's dragging me onto the dance floor, so wasted that she's ready to tumble off her six-inch fuck-me heels. She's grabbing my TV costume, trying to stay upright. Thirty seconds ago, an adolescent fantasy seemed to be coming true, but on a dime, the smoky saxophone playing in my head had turned into a blaring car alarm voice. Step away from the pet. Step away from the pet. What if she pukes on me? What if her bodybuilder boyfriend sees us and kicks my ass? My mind starts spinning, imagining the worst. In this waking nightmare, I see the bodybuilder coming toward us. Then he morphs into Donald Trump, who swoops in, catches her just before she falls, and helps her stagger off the dance floor. For one hallucinatory moment, I think, he's a classy guy after all. <laughs> then in my mind, I see him head to the door with Miss Penthouse. Was he taking the girl out to help her get a taxi? Trump hears my thoughts and says, WRONG! <laughs> when I snap out of my fever dream, I'm still stumble dancing with the pet of the year, who now looks much less appealing with her drug droopy eyelids, slurred gibberish speech, and Bowery bum stagger. I tell her, it's time for Mr. TV to take a commercial break. I peel away and dash for the dressing room in the safety of my next costume character, America's favorite dad. Bill Cosby. <laughs> Sensing a theme yet? <laughs> and speaking of themes, any professional party planner will tell you, the theme is what gives the party its magic. Party magic. Okay, so this money finance mogul out on Long Island gets this idea for a theme for his party. And the theme is sex. Not sex in the city, not sex in the alley, 
Not sex with Kate Nally, just sex. When I arrived at his newly minted McMansion, there were four trailers, one for actors, dancers, drag performers, and of course, strippers. The theme was sex. I'm then informed that I'd be playing a Pakistani man who sells pornographic magazines in a newsstand on the old 42nd Street. This was obviously offensive to my sense of decency and cultural inclusiveness, but it was pre-9-11, and the money was pretty good, and I was slightly curious about the strippers, so I swallowed my dignity and put on a rented costume that made me look like some idiot's idea of a Pakistani porn salesman, assumed my best East Indian accent, and went to work hawking X-rated magazines on a fake newsstand on some rich perv's suburban driveway. Hey, it's a living. <laughs> As the guests arrived, the host comes out to inspect my performance, and he's dressed in, wait for it, a silk bathrobe, smoking a pipe, with a copy of Playboy magazine under his arm. Yeah, this dude's idea of fun was to drop at least 200 grand on a party, so 500 of his closest friends could see him impersonate Hugh Hefner. The next magical moment happened when the one percenter's three-year-old comes out to say goodnight to daddy, and then sees the pictures of the naked women hanging on the fake Olet store in their driveway. The, the Jamaican nanny ushers the confused kid away, and dad promises himself to always remember the expression on his son's face. <laughs> like the commercial says, priceless. <laughs> yeah. For my next character, I'm dressed in a suit looking like an American businessman. For cocktails, the backyard had been transformed into Bangkok, sex holiday capital of the world. I'm now directed to enter the streets of Bangkok with my pants around my ankles, handcuffed to a voluptuous Thai policewoman who's just raided the whorehouse I was patronizing, which I hear happens all the time in Bangkok. <laughs> uh, yeah, as my captor and I move through the crowd, we encourage guests to follow us into the giant party tent that is now open for dinner. Once inside, the music is deafening. The dancers are on stage dressed in very little, awkwardly gripping stripper poles. These kids are not strippers. More like recent alums of Queens College Dance Department. I'm thinking, where are the strippers? And then I spot the pièce de résistance. At the far end of the tent sits a giant heart-shaped bed with a huge mirror hanging over it at a diagonal so everyone in the whole party can see who's in it. And who's in it? The real strippers, of course, having simulated sex with the host and some of his best friends. By the way, he's no longer Hugh Hefner. Now he's dressed in serious S&M work. Black leather studded jock strap, vest, and police hat. The outfit must have been left over from the village people number at the party planner's last bar mitzvah. <laughs> and now the host is straddling one of the stripper poles on stage and shimming up to the top of the tent. He's not that buff, so it's kind of hard for him. Excuse the pun. He's waving to all his friends. They're cheering and humping the strippers. Others have moved onto the bed with their wives and are having a wild time of it. The DJ's blasting super freak, duh. The drag performers enter, and they're the least outrageous people in the room. <laughs> I take the hand of a female guest and pull her onto the dance floor. Quite a feat with my pants still around my ankles. The strobe light strobes, the mirror ball mirrors. Finally, a ten foot tall pink paper mache penis is pushed onto the stage and climactically erupts with an explosion of cream colored confetti. Voila! Party magic. <laughs> I'm in a private palace of Western decadence being paid to entertain the rich and famous of the most powerful nation on earth. One crazy night, one hour from New York, one month before September 11th, 2001. Wow.